part 40. Section G, utilizing present opportunities. I heard something like the following, opportunity only knocks once. <laughs> this is the greatest opportunity. We continue the story, the parables of the talents. Jesus spent more time on explaining the, the, the value of talents. We're going to look, among other things, to, at, at mental faculties. Something, nothing on this planet received. Not the birds, not the animals, in a measure that we've received the frontal lobes of the brain. God requires the training of the mental faculties. Training of the mental faculties. There is so much that the brain can do. What we think we become. It is so dangerous to think of rubbish. He designs that his servants shall possess more intelligence and clearer discernment than the worldling. And he is displeased with those who are too careless or too indolent to become efficient, well-informed workers. I remember in my formal studies, I, I shared a room, study room with a, with a person. He, they tested him and they said, man, the best you can do is to become a salesman. <laughs> but he decided that he's going to spend one hour in the morning, one hour in the evening studying the Bible. This was a theological course. And his brain developed. God gave him that special blessing. And my dear friend, the more you spend time with the Word of God, the brighter you will become. Test it. The Lord bids us love him. How? With all the heart. And with all the soul. And with all the strength. Total. And with all the mind, everything. This lays upon us the obligation of developing the intellect to its fullest capacity. That with all the mind we may know and love our Creator. Develop your intellect to appreciate God a little more. And this is the greatest joy knowing and loving people and then knowing and loving God to a certain extent. We cannot fully comprehend him, but love him because he loves us. If placed under the control of his spirit, the more thoroughly the intellect is cultivated, the more I allow the Holy Spirit to work in my love, the more my mind, my intellect is cultivated. The more effectively it can be used in the service of God. So it's about God. The brighter I become, relatively speaking, because we've got bigger brains than us. And, but I develop the intellect to serve God better. It's not a selfish thing, this. It's a self-sacrificing thing. The uneducated man who is consecrated to God, not everybody's got the privilege to go and study. The uneducated man who is consecrated to God and who longs to bless others, the motive, unselfish, longs to bless others can be and is used by the Lord in his service. I don't know how brilliant or not too brilliant you are, but if you want to consecrate your life to God, even if you've had no education, he's going to use you. And this is one of the greatest blessings, to be used of God. None can know where or how they may be called to labor or to speak for God. 
Our Heavenly Father alone sees what He can make of men, women, children, young people. My friend, this is something to think about. He knows exactly how He wants to use you. Just tell Him, Lord, use me. There are before us possibilities that our feeble faith does not discern. We don't see the possibilities. Our minds should be so trained that if necessary we can present the truth of his word before the highest earthly authorities in such a way as to glorify his name. My friend, God wants your heart. He wants your intellect. He wants everything from you to dedicate to his cause because he loves you higher than the highest human thoughts can reach is God's ideal for his people godliness and God likeness is the goal to be reached we should not let slip even one opportunity of qualifying ourselves intellectually to work for God He wants to give us a higher IQ. Let the youth who need an education set to work with a determination to obtain it. That's important if you've got the opportunity to go and do some studies, degrees, master degrees, PhDs. Do not wait for an opening. Make one for yourselves. You know, we like to be fed and pushed. No. Do it yourself. Take hold of any small way to practice economy. Don't waste money. It's so easy to waste money. I told Loretta, my daughter, poor people don't buy what they need. They only buy stuff with which they cannot go through life. Be careful how you spend money. By the way, this is God's money, not yours. Take hold of any small way to practice economy. Do not spend money on gratification, rubbish, oh, of appetite, you know, junk foods. Only tastes well. Do not spend money on gratification of appetite or in ple- pleasure seeking. Jesus says, if you want to follow me, deny yourself. There's a joy in denying yourself. There's some benefits in doing it. Be determined to become as useful and efficient as God calls you to be. Be thorough and faithful in whatever you undertake. There's no menial tasks. It's a God-given privilege to work whatever work you do. Procure every advantage within your reach for strengthening the intellect. And social media makes you dumb at times. Read the Bible. Let the study of books be combined with useful manual labor. You cannot sit behind the desk or the computer all day long. You have to have physical exercise, labor. By faithful endeavor, watchfulness, and prayer, secure the wisdom that is from above. Wisdom from above. This will give you an all-round education. Thus, you may rise in character and gain an influence over other minds, enabling you to lead them on the path of uprightness and holiness. So all the gifts that God wants to give us should be used in an unselfish way to uplift people. There are millions who just exist, they don't live. We can help them. Far more might be accomplished in the work of self-education if we were awake to our own opportunities and privileges. Watch out for these moments. True education means more than the college can give. 
Well, the study of sciences is not to be neglected. There is a higher training to be obtained through a vital connection with God. A vital connection with God. Meditate upon him. Look at the life of Jesus who gives us a profile of God. This is the highest science, knowing God. You do this through the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Let every student take his Bible and place himself in communion with a great teacher. And before you read the Bible, ask the Holy Spirit to lead you. Let the mind be trained and disciplined with hard problems in search for divine truth. Please, please, God has a higher ideal for you than you can ever think. Those who hunger for knowledge that they may bless their fellow men. You see, it's again, not selfish to bless your fellow men. Uh, will themselves receive blessings from God. These are such deep thoughts. Through the study of his word, their mental powers will be aroused to earnest activity. This is a marvelous organ. It should be more developed. There will be an expansion and development of the faculties, and the mind will acquire power and efficiency. The mind will acquire power and efficiency. You know, God has got high standards for us. But remember, all his biddings are enablings. Don't be satisfied with your present spiritual condition, your, your present intellectual uh, level. Grow, continually grow. Look at this little, little girl looking at the cookie jar. Self-discipline. Self-discipline must be practiced by everyone who will be a worker for God. Say no to temptations. Say no to appetite. Don't eat between meals. Discipline, discipline, discipline. This will accomplish more than eloquence or the most brilliant talents. Self-discipline. An ordinary mind, well-disciplined, will accomplish more and higher work than will the most highly educated mind and the greatest talents without self-control. You can be brilliant, but you haven't got self-control. Uh, you cannot develop your, your maximum abilities. <laughs> Beautiful thoughts. The power of speech, this is another one, is a talent that should be diligently cultivated. The talent of speech. We can all speak, but it's got to be developed. Of all the gifts we have received from God, none is capable of being a greater blessing than this. What? The power of speech is the greatest of the blessings. With a voice we convince and persuade. With it we offer praise to God and with it we tell others of the Redeemer's love. With your voice. What a gift. How important then that it be so trained as to be most effective for good. And if you've got a problem, go to a speech therapist and let him or her help you to be a better communicator. The culture and right use of the voice are greatly, greatly neglected, even by persons of intelligence and Christian activity. Do you need to grow in this area? There are many who read or speak in so low or so rapid a manner that they cannot be readily understood. A little slower, my friend, and the impression will be better. 
people will be able to think of what you've said. There are many who read or speak in so low or so rapid a manner. I'm just illustrating a rapid a manner. That they cannot be readily understood. It's no use if people cannot understand what you're saying. Some have a thick, indistinct utterance. Others speak in high key, <laughs> in sharp, shrill tones that are painful to the hearers. Check your voice. Ask your wife, sweetheart, do you think I'm speaking well to you? Texts, hymns, reports, and other papers delivered before public assemblies are occasionally read in a way that prevents comprehension and frequently destroys their impact and force. You know, I, I listen to the scholars. Some of them you can, you can hear clearly, but others, you've got a problem. And may God help you and I to speak so that people could hear as well. This is an evil that can and should be corrected, good speaking. On this point, the Bible gives instruction. Let's listen. Of the Levites who read the scriptures, the people in the days of Ezra, it is said. Of the Levites who read the scriptures, to the people in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, it is said. All of those Levites read parts of the scroll of the law of God to the people. They made it clear to them. They told them what it meant. Sometimes we have to explain what we are saying. Did you get me? Or use an illustration. So the people were able to understand what was being read. They made it clear to the people. People must hear what you say. By diligent effort, all may acquire the power to read intelligibly and to speak in a full, clear, round tone in a distinct and impressive manner. By doing this, we may greatly increase our efficiency as workers for Christ. You don't do this for yourself. It's to serve others, to be a worker for Christ. Oh, my God's Holy Spirit, touch our lips. At times we are speaking so unkind. Don't criticize. Don't let it come from your lips. Every Christian is called to make known to others the unsearchable riches of Christ. We must tell people of the riches there is in God and in Christ. And in the Bible, therefore, he or she should seek for perfection of speech. The biggest room in the world is the room for improvement. He should present the word of God in a way that will commend it to the hearers. Speak passionately about God's book. The human vessels, people, of God are not to be rude. It is so easy to be rude. He does not desire for man to minimize or devalue the celestial river that flows through him into the rest of the world. We should look to Jesus, the perfect pattern. We should pray for the aid of the Holy Spirit and in his strength we should seek to train every organ for perfect work. The biggest room in the world is the room for improvement. God wants us to grow. He wants us to be special people. Especially is this true of those who are called to public service. Every minister and every teacher should bear in mind 
that he is giving to the people a message that involves eternal interests. Eternal interests. The truth spoken will judge them in the great day of final reckoning. We've got the responsibility, my friend, when we talk to people and the way we talk to them. And with some listeners, how the word is delivered will determine whether it is accepted or rejected. If you speak, blah, 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 <laughs> you are rejected. But when you speak with a heart full of love, it is accepted. Then let the message be delivered in such a way as to engage the intellect and stir the soul. Slowly, distinctly, and solemnly should it be spoken, yet with all the earnestness that its importance demands. Can I repeat this? Slowly. You know, we want to rush at times to get through our speech. Slowly, distinctly, and solemnly should it be spoken, yet with all the earnestness that its importance demands. Are you accepting the challenge to speak a little kinder, to speak a little loving, more loving? Every aspect of Christian service involves the appropriate use of culture, and communication. It affects our relationships with one another and our daily lives at home. We should get into the habit of speaking in a pleasant voice. I had a friend, he passed away. When he came to me, he said, good morning. <laughs> we should get into the habit of speaking in a pleasant voice, using only proper grammar and selecting words that are polite and friendly. Selecting words that are polite and friendly. We've got the power of the voice to uplift people, give them new hope. Sweet, kind words are as dew and gentle showers to the soul. Psalms 45 verse 2. Sweet, kind words are as dew. When last did you see dew? Are as dew and gentle showers, like a lovely uh, rain coming down on you, showers to the soul. The scripture says of Christ that grace was poured into his lips. Grace was poured into the lips of Jesus by the Father that he might know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. We live in a society that's weary, my friend. And God wants you to speak, pour grace upon your lips, to speak a word that will comfort people, that will challenge people to live a better life. This was written by Isaiah, that wonderful prophet. Have you read the book of Isaiah? It's a beautiful book. The scripture says of Christ that grace was poured into his lips. And this is what I need, God's grace to be poured into my lips that he, that's Christ, might know how to speak a word in season, just at the right time, to him that is weary. There are weary people that's waiting for your voice to cheer them up. And the Lord tells us in Colossians 4, 6, let your speech always be with grace. Are you driving in the traffic? What do you say to the to the, uh, to the hell drivers. 
And the Lord tells us in Colossians 4, 6, let your speech always be with grace. Seasoned with salt. You know, without salt, food is tasteless. That you may know how you ought to answer each one. That you may know how to answer each one. Such certain people need to be dressed a little different. Let no corrupt, says Paul in Ephesians, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. People need grace. You can do it with the way you speak to them. In seeking to correct or reform others, we should be careful of our words. They will be a savor of life unto life, or of death unto death. You know, some words that people spoke to me still lingers in my mind. We can be so cruel. And then other people spoke words that rings like a melody in my heart. Speak words that will be like a melody in the hearts of people. Many people use harsh, cutting language while delivering advice or reprimands. These words are not designed to soothe the wounded soul. Don't speak harsh, cutting words. Put a bit of salt in it, give it a taste. These careless remarks annoy and inflame the spirit, frequently motivating the rebellious to revolt. Like this advertisement, fight today for a better tomorrow. No, don't fight today for a better tomorrow. Be peaceful and enjoy a better tomorrow. It's so easy to be worked up by speeches. All who would advocate the principles of truth need to receive the heavenly oil of love. You know, I used to ride a bicycle, and when the chain starts to make a noise, I just put a little oil on it. We need the oil of grace when we speak. All who would advocate the principle of truth need to receive the heavenly oil of love, the heavenly oil of love in our words. Under all circumstances, reproof should be spoken well in love. You know, it's so easy to shout at our children, why did you do this? No, no. Reproof should be spoken in love. And if you haven't developed this skill, do it, my friend. Do it. Then instead of becoming irritated, our words will reform. Shouting at people will not reform them. Christ by his Holy Spirit will supply the force and the power. This is his work. He will help you to speak kind to the offender. Not a single word should be spoken carelessly. Watch your words. He who is following Christ will not let any evil speech, evil speech, foolish conversation, or impure suggestion escape his lips. A follower of Christ will not allow impure speech to escape his lips. We should be so careful. The Apostle Paul, writing by the Holy Spirit, says, don't let any evil talk come out of your mouth. Don't let any evil talk come out of your mouth. You know, I need this advice. And I'm sure you need this. Let us ask God to help you to help me. Corrupt. Communication does not mean only words that are vile. It means any expression contrary to the holy principles and pure and undefiled religion. 
It contains deceptive undertones and suggestions of evil. Oh, may God help us in our conversation. These result in serious sin unless immediately rejected. Leave suggestions out of your speech. Speak holy. Upon every family, upon every individual Christian, is laid the duty of barring the way against corrupt speech. Every family, every individual. When in the company of those who indulge in foolish talk, you know what happens in a, in, in a company of people, foolish talk. It is our duty to change the subject of the conversation if possible. Try it next time. You know, we, we are embarrassed to listen to the talk. But ask them something. What happened to you that made you happy today? Why are you grateful? You know, by the help of the grace of God, we should quietly drop words or introduce a subject that will turn the conversation in a profitable channel. Use your voice to help people talk wisdom and not nonsense. It is the work of parents, maybe you've got small children, to train their children to proper habits of speech. Man, I've seen the most beautiful kids and they speak so well, so kind. This was the influence of the parents. The very best school for this culture is the home life. There's no school like the home school. From the earliest years, children should be taught to speak respectfully. You know, some of the teenagers don't speak respectfully. They were never taught to do it. Please, please, educate your children concerning speech. From the earliest years, children should be taught to speak respectfully and lovingly to their parents and to one another. Don't talk to your sister like this, my boy. Talk to her like this. They should be taught that only words of gentleness, truth, purity must pass their lips. Words of gentleness, truth, and purity should pass their lips. Try this with your children. Only words of gentleness. Now you don't talk like this. Now gentleness. Say it again. Truth and purity should pass our lips. Let the parents themselves be daily learners in the school of Christ. Then by precept and example, they can teach their children how to speak. You know, I've listened to people and I can hear the parents there. Parents, they follow your customs, they follow your intonation in your speech. Speak beautiful, speak kindly, speak gentle. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Titus 2 verse 8. I want to read this again. In your teaching, show integrity. Words. Seriousness and soundness of speech. Speech. That cannot be condemned. Don't let them find fault with your speech. So that those who oppose you, we all have enemies, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed for opposing you because they've got nothing bad to say about us. This is one of the most greatest and most responsible of our duties to speak more positive. As followers of Christ, we should make our words 
such as to be a help and an encouragement to one another in the Christian life. When you see somebody down. I remember one time in Lebanon, we were doing a little archaeological tour. This mother, she had two small girls. And the one was a bit sad. And she said, listen, pull yourself right. Rick yourself right. <laughs> that poor little girl couldn't do that. The mother should have talked a little different to her. Why are you sad? Put a smile on your face. <laughs> Far more than we do, we need to speak of the precious chapters in our experience. You know, there are not all of all of our chapters are so pleasant, but speak of the pleasant ones. Don't highlight the bad ones, speak of the pleasant ones. Speak of the pleasant ones. We should speak of the mercy and loving kindness of God. Find something every day to speak about the loving kindness of God, of the matchless depths of the Savior's love. My friend, he loves you. Tell people that God loves them as well. Our words should be words of praise and thanksgiving, not moaning all day long. I've met people when I get there, they start moaning and complaining. Oh, you feel so depressed when you leave. No. Our words should be words of praise and thanksgiving. If the mind and heart are full of the love of God, this will be revealed in the conversation. Check yourself. I've got to check myself. It will not be a difficult matter to impart that which enters our spiritual life. What enters our spiritual life can be converted by the speech, by our words. Great thoughts, noble aspirations, clear perceptions of truth, and selfish purposes, yearnings for piety and holiness will bear fruit in words that reveal the character of the heart treasure. Fill your life with these beautiful characteristics and then speak about them. When Christ is thus revealed in our speech, it will have power in winning souls for him. Did you get this? When Christ is thus revealed in our speech, it will have power in winning souls to him. And what greater work is there than winning souls to him? Let us, all of us, try to speak better. We should speak of Christ to those who know him not. You know, we are so ashamed of Christ to people who know him not. We should do as Christ did. Wherever he was, in the synagogue, by the wayside, in the boat, thrust out a little from the land, at the Pharisee's feast, or the table of the publican, he talked to people about matters that matters relevant to the afterlife. We're on our way to heaven. Try and tell people Keep courage, my friend. We are heading for heaven. The things of nature, the events of daily life, were bound up by him, Jesus, with the words of truth. Say to somebody, you know, the flowers are budding. The mangoes are ripe. Speak positive. The hearts of his hearers, this is Jesus, were drawn to him, for he had healed their sick, yeah. had comforted their sorrowing ones, and had taken their children in his arms and blessed them. Please do the same. Put children on your lap. And speak kind words to them. When he opened his lips to speak, 
their attention was, was riveted upon him. And every word was to some soul a savor of life unto life. Can you see Jesus preaching slowly with a sweet, melodious voice? So it should be with us. As Jesus talked and cared for people, this is how we should be. Wherever we are, we should watch for opportunities of speaking to others of the Savior. If we follow Christ's example in doing good, hearts will be open to us as they did to him. No, uh, not abruptly, but with a tact born of divine love, we can tell them of him who is the chiefest among 10,000 and the one altogether lovely songs of Solomon we can tell them who is the chiefest of 10,000 the one who is altogether lovely I challenge you my friend to try and do this this is the very highest work in which we can employ the talent of speech. It was given to us that we might present Christ as the sin-pardoning Savior. You know, I live next to the Kruger National Park, but those elephants don't ever speak to me. Impala or giraffes, lions, cheetahs. They haven't got that gift. We've got that gift. Let's use it to honor God's name. F. E. Belden wrote this lyrics to that beautiful song. If any little word of mine may make a dark life brighter, if any little song of mine may make a sad heart lighter, God, help me speak speak the helping word and sweeten it with singing and drop it in some lonely veil to set the echoes ringing. Next time, the talent of influence. People are easily influenced. Have you noticed that? What did Christ teach about it? The life of Christ was an ever-widening, shoreless influence, an influence that bound him to God and to the whole human family. Through Christ, God has invested man with an influence that makes it impossible for him to live to himself. Father in heaven, forgive us for times when we spoke in a very ugly manner. Touch our lips with your kindness and help us to concentrate and practice to speak uplifting words, not words of commendation, condemnation, but words of commendation. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.